Oh, here we are. Tradenomics coming at you on a Thursday. Or maybe you're just listening to us. I don't know what that is half the time. Yeah. They just keep us in here in the dark and just say record. Timer, time compression is a real thing as you get older, by the way, kids. Mm. Uh, definitely, you know, life is long, but it's also very short at times. Anyway, back to, <laughs> uh, head of freight market intelligence at Freight Waves, Anthony Smith, chief economist. Uh, we had some big stuff come out today. If you're listening to us on Thursday, uh, it, if you're not, then it was this previously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, gross domestic product comes out at 4.9% growth. We're going to hit that one head on uh, because that's a very, I think anybody in transportation service provisions would be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and earnings are still coming out. It's still showing a lot of uh, retraction in the space. We'll dive into that. Um, but first off, let's give a quick freight market update. And you market in two and three, two, one, go. All right, let's start off with OTVI. Now, this actually may help us explain that kind of unexpected GDP growth figure. Uh, if you look at OTVI in the white line, the current year, you can see an anomalous pattern that we talked about. If you're listening to us, watching us, you know this was possible uh, because we've seen a pretty strong demand side anomaly in the, uh, the third quarter, starting specifically in July, where we had this growth pattern. Every other year, including the COVID years, tender volumes would fall. Look at the green line. Look at the blue line. <laughs> blue was the epic COVID year boom, and it still fell in July. This year, not so much. We actually had a strong July. Uh, maybe it was due to Prime Day. I don't know. Uh, but and that persisted into September. And since we have actually seen deterioration and a return to seasonality here in October, nothing to see here. We've kind of leveled off here in the last week or so in terms of overall demand, but it's still above. It's about 9% higher than 2019. So demand is not the problem with the freight market. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, next chart is going to be the O-Rail chart. Again, demand side growth. This is loaded container volumes moving throughout the United States. Look at that big spike in October. If anything, that demand erosion in, in trucking has actually been explained in rail. A lot of this is long haul freight. Uh, and that's really what was driving a lot of that freight volume in July is long haul freight. Rail demand, loaded rail container volumes, uh, getting close to all time highs there in that orange line. So definitely something to see here on the intermodal side. Let's go to the next chart. And this explains why you're not feeling it in the freight market. Tender rejection rates for van freight are on the floor specifically. Refrigerated rejection rates still holding at a relatively low level, but it's still above 5%. Flatbed rejection rates also above uh, 5 and 6% there. So you're just not feeling it. We're not hitting uh, that capacity ceiling just yet. Ding, ding. So, Zach, when we're looking at the whole overall market, one of the areas that we're seeing, I think, startup in conversations is rail looking to be a lot more competitive to truckload. And really, it seems like even some collaboration talks are starting to pop up here as well. Yeah, I, I, you know, this is an interesting thing because they drop the rates in intermodal. Uh, obviously, the sense of urgency for shippers is really not there. I think Tony and Donnie talked about this on Freightways now this morning, too. But um, there's some interesting things happening on the rail side. Uh, you know, the earnings calls, not quite uh, as robust, but most of that growth you saw there was in October. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the rail sector definitely has something to it right now. I would keep my eye on it and definitely watch People Speaking Rail with Mike Bowden <laughs> Uh coming up today, I believe, right? If you are watching today, who knows yeah. when you're watching, right? It so. is It is going to be a, a great episode, and especially whenever Mike is talking anything about rail or intermodal, definitely want to be listening to that. Mm -hmm. And Zach, of course, we got big news today. Big news. Mentioned let's earlier. go straight into this oh. one. This is newsonomics. Let's just, let's just go right into it. Now, this is not from FreightWaves.com, but because <laughs> uh, we're not necessarily an economic-centric media uh, side, um, but... CNBC uh, article here is the one that I kind of pulled up. Uh, GDP grew at 4.9% annual pace in the third quarter, better than expected. I think that better than expected may be a slight understatement. <laughs> it, I mean, one of the big things that we look at here over all of the, I think, support came from, of course, was the consumer. And 
of course, we've seen anecdotal evidence throughout the entire summer. We saw, and, and after the summer, and going now into the fall, where we're seeing big artists going on tour, of course. We look at Barbie Heimer. Um, that was a huge moment. Barbenheimer, yeah. That was, that was massive. <laughs> we see, of course, Taylor Swift just taking over the world, mostly the U.S., and then you see Drake going on tour, your favorite artist. Oh. And then we also see Beyonce just changing uh, sheen marketplaces for outfits to coordinate with the themes of the show. So we've just seen so many big instances of service spending and so many activities going on throughout this summer, and the consumer hasn't slowed down in right. that aspect at all. Now we're looking at the good side, and when and I also need to back up because one of the things that we do yeah. as market experts, we put out a Sonar monthly market update, yeah. and we have tons of information. Usually it's over 20 pages um, right. of content for those Sonar subscribers. And I try to do an open economic commentary and try to make it somewhat, you know, pleasant, <laughs> but I don't, I don't want to get around the truth. And then I also try to get into something that's applicable for the industry. Right. One of the big things that I opened up with for this month is recovery, recession, and resilience. And they're all talking points. It just depends where you are. So yeah. if you're in the freight world, we're talking recession. If you're in some parts of manufacturing, you're talking recovery. If you're in the leisure hospitality service side, you're talking resilience. And right. so when we're looking at this GDP number, it's not going to be an overwhelming representation of what's happening in the freight world. Of course, you're going to have some green shoots if you're in the, the service side and some of those aspects really kind of run off into you, whether you're food bev in some aspects for concert venues or during transportation for some stages, whatever it might be, maybe you're impacted by that. But all these other aspects aren't going to be representative of what might be going on in your industry. Yeah. So I guess, you know, it, it says here in the article that the sharp increase came due to contribu contributions from consumer spending, Increased inventories, I'm not really sure how to handle that one, <laughs> uh, exports, <laughs> and residential investment and government spending. Now, the government spending one is not the shocker here. And I, I would love to see the breakdown uh, because, you know, obviously have the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that did anything but reduce inflation. And that's showing up right here. Um, government spending is the one component of this that I would love to see how, how big that was. But I'm going to push that to the side for the moment. Consumer spending... Um, and that's not necessarily durable goods. It's kind of like the services that you're talking about, the Barbenheimers and, and all this stuff. How much of that, like, because we see it in demand, like our freight demand now, it's not up year over year in that regard. I mean, just because you're shipping things. And again, we were cooling off at that point in time. A lot of short, a much shorter haul freight last year versus this year uh, as well. So Inventory, like we, we can see this sales churn kind of show up there. How much of this do you think came from spending on durable goods? I think there has been, so I don't think durable goods spending is mm -hmm. going to just completely fall off this holiday right. season. I think it's going to be spread out. So we've seen, of course, I was, we used to joke about, you know, Black Friday um, shopping mm -hmm. uh, about a year and a half or maybe two years ago now. Um, and it just turned into almost like Black November because people were just getting deals throughout the entire month. It wasn't just this one day of deals. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that aspect is kind of spilled over into where we are now. So we see multiple Amazon Prime Days. And then yeah, it was a retailers. Prime Day in July. It was a Prime yeah. Day in July. Then we see another deal day. Yeah. Um, I think it was a two-day uh, event. And then we see other outlets, of course, following suit right. because if Amazon's doing it, you got to follow the wave. And so I think we're going to start to see more and more retailers and outlets know that they have to compete with services for one and then have to compete with each other for best deals and bargains because although the U.S. consumer is going to spend on goods, I think because of the service side aspect that's going to play a larger role this holiday season going into the fourth quarter, they're also going to be looking at deals, bargains. Right. Okay, I maybe I do want a TV, but I'm going to shop for the best deal. I'm not just going to go with the do you best feel, specs. Do you feel good about this, though? Like, this 4.9% growth is actually something economists generally say they don't like to see because that's that's like an overheating mm -hmm. uh, of the economy. Do you agree with that? I, I definitely agree with some aspects of that, and that's this is one of the reasons why I think we were joking around um, 
maybe a couple months ago with mm-hmm. retail sales when it had, I think, a pretty good report yeah. or pretty good print. And I was like, I, I'm not happy about this. <laughs> I'm not happy right? about this at all. Um, especially when we start to look at other consumer conditions, when you mm-hmm. start looking at um, credit card utilization, when you right. start looking at uh, the overall debt levels, when you start looking at disposable income. Um, these are the other aspects that kind of start to bring some worrying signs of, hey, you want to see some resilience, you want to see some of those great signals, but what are the underlying conditions for these U.S. consumers? Yeah, I have a chart. I, I don't know if we we pull it up, but it's over leveraging here. Like, are we over leveraging as a population? And this is this is something I pulled out of uh, uh, somewhere. I think it might have been Bloomberg. Uh, but it, it's a, a chart that basically says other high income economy savings rates <laughs> uh, versus the U.S. And the U.S. Of course, coming out of in COVID, we had high savings rates, and our savings rates are falling. And they even cite that as you know in the article about the saving the personal savings rate declined to 3.8 percent in the third quarter compared to 5.2 percent in the previous period um like are we just throwing a bunch of stuff on a credit card now yes <laughs> yes <laughs> like, and, is and, this that's what's concerning about this because with interest rates going up so it's not the just borrow goes up we're spending more money on the stuff yeah but the cost of buying the stuff is also going up on the back end because of the interest rate increases exactly. on the credit card. Exactly. And there's other, I think, aspects of this debt situation that mm-hmm. a lot of Gen Z, a lot of millennials, maybe even some Gen Xers aren't really kind of taken into an account, yeah. but mostly uh, younger millennials and, and Gen Z. And that's the buy now, pay later aspect yeah. as well, where that's just uh, a mechanism that has really kind of taken a lot by storm, I think over the last year and a half or so, Mm -hmm. it's just become a much more popular option for a lot of folks for financing. And they're not seeing it as, Mm -hmm. you know, um, this is debt. I'm just like, hey, you know what? I have no interest Mm -hmm. and I'm just going to pay these monthly payments and Mm -hmm. it's all going to be fine. But if something were to happen, there are some penalties if you start missing payments and then that kind of starts to snowball into other impacts. And so the big saving grace right now is going to be the labor market, of course. So 9.6 million job openings, 3.8% unemployment rate. Um, Looking at initial jobs claims, well under 250,000 initial claims. Um, You start to see all these other signs within the labor market that shows, and I think that's where some of the Fed's really kind of sticking to, okay, we can hold higher for longer. We're seeing the consumer activity. They're not slowing down all that much. We're seeing um, inflation, finding some sticking points, not slowing down all that as much as they would probably like to see. And so they have evidence to kind of keep rates higher for longer here. Yeah. So you don't think that they're going to actually take this as a signal they need to increase interest rates, do you? (sighs) They have an argument Mm -hmm. for it, but I think, I don't think... Maybe we'll see one more increase, uh, maybe a quarter point. But I don't think that Jay Powell and the FOMC have it in them to do, you know, more increases going into 2024, first quarter, second quarter, anything like that. Um, I think they have enough data to suggest that this is something that they can keep rates elevated. And the other big thing is, I think, um, of course, as you know, it takes time for these interest rates to translate into truly impacts throughout the macroeconomy. And so we're not going to start to see some of these impacts for these interest rate increases until maybe second quarter of 2024, maybe even to third quarter of 2024, that we start to see some of these significant impacts here. And so I think there's that whole thing of the Fed understanding that, hey, there's going to be a lag effect here. How much of an impact on the back end are are we going to start to see? And on that back end, if we start to see rates come down, Will inflation already be tamed by then? Because if inflation is not tamed by then, I think it's quicker to have a reaction on the front end to lower interest rates with more purchasing and and, and, um, borrowing of money than on the back end when you're trying to contain that inflation genie and put it back in the bottle. Yeah. uh, So the the housing market Mm. also showing some signs of life here as well. And this is obviously a huge component. It's not just the housing you know, the buying of the house itself and all the construction for the, the freight people out there. Uh, it's also the downstream stuff. You right. talk about this all the time, the furniture, the electronics, all the finishings that go into a house. Like do, there, there's a trending up in terms of new home purchases here. What do you make of this? Yeah. So I think we're looking at housing, of course. So latest housing starts showed an upward movement. I think it was an increase of 7% for the month and it's been a little bit volatile, but we did see some upward movement overall mm-hmm. starts. Um, the other big thing is when you look at the other parts of the Census Bureau report from housing and construction, it has um, stats for homes 
authorized but not started and homes under construction. Those are still at historic highs. Right. And so we're starting to see that there's a significant backlog building up of new construction. Um, so there's a long runway of homes that have okay. been authorized, just not started or still under construction. And then a start doesn't mean that there's framework material, just means ground has been broken. So. Mm -hmm. This construction under construction thing, even though it's come down some, is still at historic highs. Um, the other big thing, of course, we have to take into account is existing home inventory. That ticked up, I think it was 2% or so, or I think it was 2%. Let me make sure here I have it. Um, I think it was 2.7%, yep. But it's still down 8.1% on a year-over-year -year basis, so okay. still not where it needs to be. Um, and the lack of existing home inventory is definitely going to put upward pressure on, on new on new. Got new it. construction. So, um, but as you said, there's that downstream impacts um, for that homes, new furniture, new electronics, appliances. When we start thinking about that aspect. That's where it kind of intermingles with the state of the consumer. So we have student loans back on track. Um, we have uh, credit card debt hitting highs. We have eight percent mortgages. <laughs> eight percent mortgages. And so you're going to be a little bit more strapped for cash. And so instead of just buying maybe that. Um, sofa you wanted do they yeah. still say sofa Does, depends on what country sure. part of the country and sofa, sofa. couch yeah. <laughs> that you want or tv yeah um you might go down in budget or you might slow down so furniture was down substantially year over year in the mm -hmm. most re recent resale, retail sales report right and of course retail sales not adjusted for inflation so probably even lower and then on top of that when you're looking at existing homes um there's some downstream impacts of, as well um not just for um those that are purchasing the home, but homeowners as well. So one of the other big downstream impacts is going to come from um, renovations. Um, yeah. That was a big thing throughout COVID. You know, like, you know what, I'm trapped in this house. Let's let's knock down that wall and open this up. <laughs> you know, Yeah, it's, building materials also. Building materials. Yeah. And so one of the things is, is that we're likely going to see, I think, a reduction mm -hmm. in um, renovation projects because you start thinking about uh, elevated interest rates, what that's going to mean to home, the cost of home equity. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of homeowners might lower or, or, or shrink the scope of those projects or maybe push those projects off uh, and to maybe, hey, maybe we'll do this in the spring. Maybe we'll push this off until next summer. Maybe we don't need this after all. And I think some of that mentality is also going to be some of the things that we see with some aspects within manufacturing as well. Yeah. So, I mean, as this pertains to the freight market, I don't know that there's anything really like to take away here other than we still have a ton of <laughs> trucks <laughs> right we have so much capacity that this demand side increase has been somewhat invisible mm -hmm. uh to the majority because we're in a freight recession and that you know you can have increasing demand but if you have tons of supply you're not going to necessarily feel it that way right right yeah so i wrote this chart of the week this past week uh you know basically how long does the com capacity how long does it take capacity to uh, to correct itself? And I pulled up uh, this chart, uh, the OTVI monthly versus, and we talked about this on Freight Waves Now earlier this morning, versus the uh, Carrier Details Total Trucking Authority. So that's FMCSA-based data showing you the growth in trucking authorities in white over the last five years and OTVI monthly in green. Huge gap. <laughs> uh, even though, you know, the near term trend since the start of 2023, we're seeing this uptick in tender volumes. We've been declining on the trucking authorities. And this is a little noisy data. It's not a great way. It's not the perfect way, I should say, to measure capacity in its purest form. But it is good directionally. And the fact is, is that this index, this carrier details index, rarely goes down, mm -hmm. <laughs> if ever, because there's lagging properties to this, this data set. Uh, but it's, it's going down at its fastest rate in history. But this is on the heels of its fastest growth mm -hmm. in, in history. And you can see there is a long way to go here. And I think this is why the freight market itself, 4.9% GDP normally would have been like, oh, we are blowing up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and not this year. And that's one other thing. So we have here um, internally at Freight Waves on Sonar is the goods adjusted GDP, which mm -hmm. subtracts some of those service spends that don't aren't going to have as much of an impact on the yeah. goods market. And so I think that's always, and you can do some of that analysis on your own, looking at some of the different components of GDP, just trying to make it helpful and simple mm -hmm. for you in Sonar. But one of the big things is when you're looking at that goods side, mm -hmm. you have to kind of look at to uh, the, also the investment side. And so not just the consumer, but manufacturers as well. And just yeah. like different components of the macro economy that are in recovery, 
um, showing signs of resilience or in the midst of a recession like freight. Um, one of the things you're going to see here within manufacturing is that a lot of the different subcategories across the board are also going to start to show different trends. So, of course, you have the UAW strike, which is going to kind of start to play a different factor into the automotive segment. You have um, anything that might be industrial production around, let's say, electronics. Mm -hmm. um, that's faring a, a bit a better on a year-over-year -year basis compared to some of the other subcomponents within manufacturing. So, you have all these different components within manufacturing that I think are also going to play a big role on, on the other side. And I think manufacturers in this higher just rate environment will also start to be a bit hesitant as well. I think um, inventory replenishment, I think on the manufacturing side for many industries are going to be a little bit slower right. as a lot of uh, folks look to just hold off. Maybe I can get a better rate or maybe I can get a better price on replenishment. Mm -hmm. And then also capital good expenditures. We've seen that really start to kind of some momentum building there. Um, but that's going to be more pricey in this higher interest rate environment. So if I'm a business owner and I need some CapEx going on, maybe if it's not dire, I can hold off and just say, all right, you know what? I have an expectation that interest rates are going to maybe come down sooner. Yeah. And so beforehand, we knew that there was going to be an interest rate increase. So there was this pull forward in manufacturing right. new orders, CapEx. Now we're seeing like backlog of orders in the ISM PMI, even though the new orders component and production numbers yeah, it's are almost getting like higher. a sense of hesitancy yeah has actually created a bit a little bit of a an overcorrection yeah imagine that <laughs> yeah. uh if you will in terms of the inventory levels right is that, is that fair i think so yeah. because you look at the backlog of orders mm -hmm. it's i think around 41 42 mm -hmm. percentage points mm -hmm. while um you know the actual PMI itself is at mm -hmm. 49 percentage points. Uh, new orders starting to take up to 49 and change, I believe, as well. Um, but so we're seeing some of that disconnect. And so I think a lot of hesitancy, a lot of wait and see. And I think resilience, recovery, and recession are still on the minds of everyone. It's just going to depend who you talk to and what segment they're in. I'll be real. I don't trust this 4.9 percent. There's <laughs> something wrong. Uh, this does not square with me uh, at all. And I don't I, trust I, that 9.6 million job openings. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's something we're, we're I think we have yet to see here because most of the report, even in that article, is basically saying, look, we're, we don't expect this to to actually sustain. Mm -hmm. We we they almost admitted. I mean, even in the articles, like the Fed's not going to raise rates because, and I'm like. This is literally counter to logic in mm -hmm. terms of what you have been talking about. You're supposed to have cooled the economy, and it looks like it's grown. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you're talking about this short-term and long-term outlook here. And I think that's really where we're at, is that a lot of these consumption habits are short-term, and they're not actually seeing the long-term impacts of putting this all on their credit card right. and all this debt that's building up in the United States. I mean, as a country, we have a debt thing. We have a debt problem. You know, this is in Congress. <laughs> and I think that's 100 percent right. So you look at the yeah. national debt that yeah. continues to yeah. tick up at an exponential rate. We we love to spend money we don't have. Yeah, <laughs> we learned it from you, government. Yeah. And so that's just I think the big takeaway yeah. here is that this we're a, a country of consumption. Yeah, not so much a country of producing, unless you're talking about TikTok trends that shouldn't <laughs> exist. That's what we like to produce as well. But that's going to be one of the big takeaways I think yeah. from this GDP report is the sustainability from it. And I. I I'm right there with you as yeah. to what's sustainable. And like I said, that job openings number, 9.6 million, we don't have that many people unemployed. I don't believe and it. And <laughs> the rate of hires haven't kept up with it. Yeah. And so that also kind of, if there's really 9.6 million openings mm -hmm. at, and hires are slowing down, there's a, I'm not a labor economist by any means, but there's a lot to dig into those. Removing numbers. COVID, what was the highest GDP growth figure we've had over the last 20 years? Do you have that on the top of your head? I don't have it on top of my head, but I, I would probably guess it was probably soon after 2009, if I had to guess. I have to, I have to double check, though. Okay. But this is pretty high. I mean, historically speaking, 4.9% is historically high. 4.9% is historically high. It's not normal. Yeah. Um, we, we target what, two? Two to three two percent. Yeah, um, I think is what most people feel definitely comfortable. Two point five. Ooh, party. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't like this number. So anybody out there on Twitter talking about how all the naysayers and doomsayers or whatever were wrong, like I, I would give it a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this, if anything, this is actually this may be more concerning to me than than like say a, you know, a, low, a much lower figure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that's that's the other big aspect is. What's going to be the reaction from it? Yeah. Um, 
And I don't want to like be a doomsayer. I hate that. Uh, like, because you can almost like self-fulfill, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You have to be really careful. It's not like I want a recession. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to like, cause that can actually make, you know, things come true. What is it? Uh, Roosevelt federal, uh, said basically, uh, the only thing to fear is fear itself. And that's, yeah. That's true. So it's not like, hey, stop spending money because we're scared <laughs> of a recession. That's that's not what I'm saying. It's just like there's some things that aren't logically like making sense here. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the the trend that's almost been at play here mm -hmm. for like the last post COVID years. <laughs> right. What makes sense? What makes 2020. sense? What doesn't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, a lot of expectation is around, you know, what second half of 2024, we'll start mm -hmm. to see a lot more balance in unison mm -hmm. instead of this discord that we're seeing in different parts of the economy but whenever i'm making a forecast whenever i'm drawing out any kind of conclusions i don't you can't get caught up in one month of boom you can't right. get caught up in a quarter look at the overall trend and the underlying uh indicators yeah, right. as well because that's going to tell you what you need to know right so yeah there's still you know it, it it seems good i'll take it for what it's worth but i'm not going to over I'm not going to overreact to this one. No. I'm just going to sit back. Sit back. Also, right. put it on my credit card. Go Aggies. Six oh, and three. I see you I guys. Mean, wow. Yeah. Doing it. Bold, time. Bold, my balls. F3 coming up. Yeah. Um, you know what? You know what this economy is like? My balls, I feel like. Mm. First half. Mm.